Thank you. Good afternoon. Are you ready to all join me on a trip trillions and trillions of kilometers across to the far side of the universe? Yes. All right. Good enthusiasm. Before we do that, though, I have a confession to make. At various points in my life, I have been addicted to watching thousands of hours of astronomy videos on YouTube, playing solitaire, or watching Judge Judy reruns on TV, okay? Now, I hear some of you laughing at me, but come on, you got to fess up to which TV shows you've been binge-watching lately, <laughs> or which reality TV shows maybe you've been obsessing with, or maybe you're just spending hours and hours of time on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, getting that endorphin rush every time someone posts your Facebook page, or maybe getting an endorphin rush every time you receive a text message. And it's interesting because I worry about our new digital age of kids that are growing up now. These kids are bathed in bits, the first digital, truly digital generation. And I worry about the thousands of hours they're spending online, on social media, etc. And I worry about their abilities to build relationships with friends and families and things like that, and to be really smart in what they're doing and focus on things that matter in their lives. And it really got me thinking about addictions. And a lot of us are aware of substance use disorders, like alcohol, drugs, and cigarettes, but many of us are not familiar with process addictions. Hong Kong University recently uh, did some research that said about 400 million people worldwide are addicted to the internet. Several million are addicted to online gaming, and potentially up to half a billion people are addicted to television. In fact, a recent Harris research poll asked kids what they wanted to be when they grow up. And guess what? American and British kids were three times more likely to want to be a YouTuber when they grow up rather than an astronaut, <laughs> okay? And yet Chinese kids overwhelmingly said they wanted to be an astronaut when they grew up. So I worry that Western societies are losing our focus on STEM, getting educated in STEM and getting careers in STEM. And, and that's a big concern to me. So one of the things I like to talk about in terms of astro astronomy and cosmology is how can we get people excited about this stuff and focus on some stuff that really potentially matters in their lives. So let me start by taking this journey into the Eagle Nebula, uh, a short journey of only 60 quadrillion kilometers, where we're going to see the most famous Hubble picture ever taken. Can anyone uh, tell me the name of this object here? Anybody know? Yell it out. Okay, it's called the Pillars of Creation, just an amazing image that Hubble was able to take. But with each one of these Hubble images, we also make amazing discoveries. In this particular thing here, scientists discovered these nodules here called evaporating gas globules, uh, or eggs for short, which are basically just all kinds of dust, dust and gas that are crashing together because gravity is pulling it together. And it reaches a million degrees, and then 10 million degrees, and then 18 million degrees, and at that point, magic happens because nuclear fusion occurs and a star is born. So not only are we getting the beauty of the universe, but we're making these amazing discoveries, and right now we are in this golden age of astronomy. So I suggest we have to do four things to really get people excited about this stuff and focusing on it. One is to make it inspiring, and I wanted to share with you my story about getting inspired about this stuff. I was uh, surfing around YouTube one day, and I saw this uh, video, a computer animation, about something called galactic cannibalism, where two galaxies come crashing together. And it's interesting because this computer animation, we believe, is very accurate because it's interspersed with actual images from the Hubble telescope, like this picture here that you're about to see, where it caught two galaxies colliding together. And then once again, the computer animation shows what likely happens when 200 billion stars come crashing together, and once again, the actual Hubble image showing the evidence that we're seeing this out in the universe. So that's pretty amazing. The second thing that uh, actually inspired me was just the huge cosmic distances involved in the universe. Let me introduce you to our closest star, Proxima Centauri. You might have heard that it's only four light years away, which doesn't sound that far, right? But guess what? If we were to take our fastest spaceship, which is about 700,000 kilometers an hour, 260 times faster than a speeding bullet, it would still take us 
10, it would still take us 15,000 years to get there. And forget about trying to fly there in a Boeing 747. That would take you over 10 million years. And that's our closest star, <laughs> which, by the way, happens to have a planet orbiting around it as well. So who knows? Maybe we'll find life there one day if we have a few generations <laughs> of people that can visit. So that was inspiring. The next thing that was inspiring was this picture that Hubble Telescope took of a spot in the sky that didn't appear to have any stars at all. And Hubble stared at it for 11 days straight. And guess what it discovered in this tiny spot in the sky? 10,000 stars. No, wait, that's not right. These aren't stars. What are these smudges? These are galaxies, each with about 100 billion stars in them. And by the way, this isn't a huge spot in the sky. This is a tiny little spot in the sky. In fact, it's only one thirteen millionth of the sky. It would be like me taking out a straw and simply looking up to the sky uh, with this straw-sized image. And we see in this one image 1,000 trillion stars. And in this one straw-sized image, trillions and trillions and trillions of planets and moons, each with the po possibility of hosting alien life. Okay, So just amazing things like that that really got me inspired about that. Number two, we have to make this stuff mind-blowing. So I always love to talk about the bizarre and extreme things in the universe. But to get into that, what's the one thing that we as Canadians love to complain about? Yeah, the weather, the heat, the cold, whatever. But guess what? That's nothing compared to what we get out in the universe. All you have to do is visit Venus, which is nearby, on its surface, 500 degrees Celsius, 900 degrees Fahrenheit, and it rains sulfuric acid, okay? <laughs> Not a very nice place to be. Or how about this planet where it actually rains rocks? <laughs> Okay, or how about visiting this giant blue planet, which is 1,000 degrees Celsius, 20 times hotter than any spot on planet Earth, 7,000 kilometer an hour winds, and it rains molten glass sideways. <laughs> okay, and how about this discovery? NASA has discovered the first ever circumbinary planet, a planet that actually has two suns. That's right, if you were to live on this planet, you would actually have two shadows, and every day you would get to see two sunrises and two sunsets. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? And it's just like the planet Tatooine in the movie Star Wars, if you've ever seen that. They had two suns as well. But as they say, science is even more amazing than science fiction. So NASA has even found the first planet that orbit, orbits in a solar system with three suns. So any place you look up on this planet, you're going to see a sun. In fact, you'll go 140 Earth years of daylight with ever seeing nighttime. <laughs> so that's kind of amazing. And what about this interstellar gas cloud? It's actually made out of ethyl alcohol, the same ingredient as beer. Okay? In fact, it contains 300,000 pints of beer. No, wait. It actually contains 300,000 pints of beer for every person on planet Earth to drink every day for the next billion years. <laughs> okay? Imagine that party, right? It's no, it's no wonder Neil deGrasse Tyson loves to say the universe is under no obligation to make sense to you, right? Or the most extreme thing that people love to talk about, these things called black holes, gravity so powerful, not even light can escape, but swirling around it is this accretion disk of gas, gas and dust traveling at near light speed over a billion degrees that kind of lights up the sky in this area. The interesting thing about this particular black hole from a galaxy called M87 is that it's A, it's 6.5 billion times bigger than our sun, but secondly, when we, when we took this next picture, which was a recent discovery, the first ever picture of a black hole, Einstein predicted these things 100 years ago, but just recently we got the first ever visual photographic, photographic evidence that black holes actually exist. But the cool thing about this picture is that you're not, if you were to see this picture that we just took now, it looks like a great picture. But we're not seeing this black hole as it is right now. We're seeing it as it looked 55 million years ago, because that's how long it took the light from that black hole to reach us. Okay, So that's kind of mind-boggling. Let's talk a little bit more about that by making the universe personal to each one of us. So I want to talk about how we can do that. If you were to go out tonight and you might catch a glimpse of a really large star called Betelgeuse, 
It's near the end of its life. It's about to explode into a supernova explosion. You would actually look at it and say, wow, that Betelgeuse looks beautiful tonight. But guess what? You're not looking at Betelgeuse as it looks tonight. You're looking at Betelgeuse as it looked in the year 1376 because it took the light 642 years to get to us. Okay? So Betelgeuse might have already exploded into a supernova explosion, but we may not know about it for hundreds of years. So an interesting aspect. You, in effect, are a time travel. You can look back in time simply by looking up to the sky. How about the periodic table of elements? We're actually now discovering what every single element in the periodic table of elements, how it was produced, what temperatures and pressures were needed to produce it. And so let me ask you, what's the most common molecule in the human body? Anyone know? Most common thing in body? Water, made up of H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. Well, guess what? All of the hydrogen in your body was produced 13.8 billion years ago at the time of the Big Bang. Even the carbon and nitrogen in your body was produced 5 to, eight, five to 10 billion years ago when stars exploded. Even the iron in your blood, blood and the calcium in your bones was produced 5 to 10 billion years ago when these stars exploded. They spewed out their enriched guts into the universe and somehow those elements landed here on Earth and produced all of us. What else? A few more fun facts about the universe. The fastest thing in the universe you may know is light, which travels 300,000 kilometers every second. But who can tell me what the second fastest thing in the universe is? No, it's not sound. Okay, I'll give you a hint. That's right. That's right, it's Superman. Now, it got me thinking, wouldn't you love to be able to fly like Superman? Wouldn't you love to be able to fly as fast as Superman? Which got me thinking, how fast is Superman anyway? Superman's faster than a... That's right, he's faster than a speeding bullet. Which got me thinking, I better Google this, how fast is a speeding bullet? As it turns out, a speeding bullet's about 2,700 kilometers an hour, about 25 times faster than you flying down the highway. But guess what? You are in motion as you're sitting here. We're flying around the solar system, around the sun. In fact, the entire Milky Way galaxy with us in it is flying across the universe at 2 million kilometers an hour. So when you go to bed tonight, by the time you wake up in the morning, you will have traveled 15 million kilometers across the universe. Sweet dreams, my friend. <laughs> But you're probably saying, come on, Tom, that's cheating. I'm just lying in bed. Superman gets to fly around buildings and save Lois Lane and all that kind of stuff. I'm with you, so now we got to fly like Superman, and I'm going to tell you how we can do that. A couple of ways. The first thing you're going to do is, on your next vacation, all you have to do is travel 1.4 billion kilometers, visit Saturn's moon Titan, where the gravity is so weak and the atmosphere is so thick that you could literally strap on wings and fly. Okay, And once again, that's a little far to go on vacation, so I got a better solution. All you have to do is travel 400 kilometers, roughly the distance from Toronto to Ottawa, except you have to do it straight up to visit the International Space Station, where you will be able to fly in microgravity like Superman or like this NASA astronaut, Peggy Whitson. So I want all of our kids and our grandkids to know they can fly like Superman or like Superwoman when they grow up, okay? So in summary, you can fly at over 2 million kilometers an hour. You have the power to look back in time. You are billions of years old, and you are made of stardust. How about a hand for everybody in the room? Okay. Number four, we have to make this stuff engaging, especially for our kids. And one of the ways we can do that is to become a citizen scientist. Every person on planet Earth can become a citizen scientist. I'm going to tell you how, how to do that. So you can go to websites, websites like Boink, Zooniverse, and spacehack.org, where you can become a citizen scientist, as well as your kids and grandkids, and you can do it passively or actively and proactively. Passively, you can simply let some of these programs take over your computer while you're out running errands and stuff. So if you sign up for the SETI at Home program, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, 
while you're out running errands, your computer is going to be looking for radio signals from aliens from the far side of the universe. Wouldn't it be great if you could help, help make that discovery? Or you could do it proactively by actually accessing real NASA data. So NASA is now crowdsourcing an analysis of billions of billions of data points and images that the scientists just don't have time to look through. So for example, you can analyze data of exoplanets in distant solar systems to find exoplanets in the habitable zone that might host alien life. So you could be one of the first to discover that first planet that actually hosts alien life. Or you can analyze the NASA data of asteroids or near-Earth objects that are flying by us that might be big enough to destroy all life on planet Earth. Well, guess what? NASA now has the technology. If we spot one of these early enough, they actually have the technology to deflect it so it won't hit Earth. So you could be the citizen scientist that saves planet Earth. <laughs> okay, that would be great. So in summary, we've got to make it inspiring, uh, mind-blowing, we've got to make it personal, and we really got to engage people uh, in all of this. So my idea worth spreading is really just the idea that each of us take a critical look at every minute of every day, every hour of every day, what we're spending that time on, and maybe, just maybe, we can transform our living rooms and our family rooms from a place where we're just totally wasting time on stuff to a place where we're learning about the universe around us and a place where we're actually getting inspired by the universe around us. So we may not have all the answers about the universe, but the quest to unravel its mysteries can be our greatest inspiration. With one teacher, one open mind, and one book, you can change your world and the world of your loved ones around you. So thank you very much for coming today. Thank you.